Hi there. I'm Dr. Trevor Cates. Welcome to the Spa Doctor Podcast. I'm in a little different environment today. I'm in the cabins in the mountains in Utah, and I'm very excited to share with you today's interview with my guest, holistic psychiatrist, Dr. Kelly Brogan, and we're covering the truth about depression. Dr. Brogan is author of the new book, A Mind of Your Own, and co-editor of the textbook, Integrative Therapies for Depression. She completed her psychiatric training and fellowship at NYU Medical Center after graduating from Cornell University Medical College and has a BS from MIT in systems neuroscience. She is board certified in psychiatry, psychosomatic medicine, and integrative holistic medicine, and is specialized in a root cause resolution approach to psychiatric syndromes and symptoms. She's also a mother of two children. In this interview, Dr. Brogan covers some pretty shocking information about the conventional approach to depression. She explains what the root cause of depression really is, or what she thinks it is, which is very different from what other psychiatrists are saying. And she discusses a holistic approach that is surprisingly similar to what I talk about when addressing skin issues. So please enjoy this interview with Dr. Brogan. Dr. Brogan, it's so great to have you on my show. So great to be here. So I know you are a woman on a mission. You are trying to get the word out about depression, the truth about depression. So tell us what it's been like. What are you up to? What is going on? What is your this this big goal that you have? Yeah, so contrary to popular belief, I, you know, I started out as an incredibly conventional doctor. I'm sort of a died in the wool psychiatrist. I come from a very sort of, you know, mainstream type family of my parents worshipped everything that, you know, the medical establishment has to say, and they still do in many ways. And so it wasn't really until uh, late, almost at the end of my training, that I took a very sharp left turn. And I specialized in uh, women's health psychiatry. It was very new field when I was finishing my fellowship at the time. But essentially what I was specialized in was um, decisions around medicating pregnant and postpartum women, um, issues specific to you know female populations, whether it's menopause or menstrual issues. And um, I was pregnant at the time. And so I sat every day and talked to women about whether or not they should take their psychiatric medications, maybe that they were on during pregnancy. And I remember having this little voice inside that told me, I would never feel totally comfortable taking a medication like this, you know, during pregnancy, I happened to be pregnant, even though I knew all the data cold, I knew there were 25,000 cases, you know, in the literature of of antidepressant medication exposure during pregnancy. And for the most part, there wasn't, you know, any major concerns emerging, but it wasn't until I was, um, nine months postpartum that I was diagnosed with an autoimmune condition called Hashimoto's. And, uh, you know, I had not dramatic symptoms, but I was definitely impaired, super forgetful, you know, hair loss. I was double booking patients. I felt really flat. Um, not myself. And at the prospect of taking a synthetic prescription for the rest of my life, I sort of said, no, there's got to be another way to do this. So I actually had, amazingly, the the intuition to consult a naturopath. And I did that. Um, and that was the beginning of my journey. So within six months, because of dietary change and supplementation, I had brought my uh, thyroid antibodies from the high 2000s to normal range. And within about another year, I was off natural hormone. Uh, so I had reversed, or at least put into remission, what I had learned in, in medical school would be a lifelong chronic and maybe even disabling condition. So this really, you know, sort of uh, raised some flags for me because I, you know, I have a naturally skeptical, uh, you know, temperament. And I began to wonder, like, why was it that I never heard about? I had one hour of nutrition in my entire 10 years of medical training. I never learned that nutrition was relevant, certainly not to potentially reversing chronic disease. So that was sort of the, the beginning. And I began to dive into the literature. I spent 
you know, the better part of five or so years obsessively reading everything I could get my hands on that I hadn't been exposed to in my training and, and everything about just, you know, about every pharmaceutical product under the sun, but specifically about psychiatric medications. Uh, I read a book a friend gave me called Anatomy of an Epidemic, and it's by an investigative journalist, Robert Whitaker. And it, compelled me to put down my prescription pad because basically what he argued in that book was, you know, here is all the data nobody's talking about. This is the non-industry funded data so that the pharmaceutical companies have had little to do with producing, right? And essentially he shows, you know, really beyond a shadow of a doubt, in my opinion, that the long-term use of all psychiatric medications, but we'll just talk about antidepressants for the moment, Uh, results in worse outcomes than if you'd never taken it. And he said, you know, here's the evidence. We have depression as the number one cause of disability worldwide. And we also have more patients taking antidepressants than ever before in human history. Like, shouldn't more treatment mean less disability, right? Shouldn't those be inversely proportional, right? So that... It was when I began to start to discontinue patients from medication. So I would ask, you know, a question we were never trained to ask. Like, what do you think about maybe transitioning off medication? And whomever was interested, we would get started on that. And that's when I learned, you know, about the deep, dark uh, secret in psychiatry, which is about how habit forming these medications are and that they really in my opinion, after many years now of tapering patients off of medication, are the most habit-forming chemical on earth. I think far more so than heroin or crack cocaine, Oxycontin, alcohol, nothing compares to psychotropics. And specifically, for reasons I don't think we really understand yet, to antidepressants. So I began to, to feel very passionately about what I had learned about in my conventional training, which is the importance of informed consent. Right. So if you're going to make a decision about your health care, you should know the whole picture, right? You should know the full picture of risks known, the full picture of why we think there are benefits and what they are, and the full picture of alternatives. And that, you know, remains my sort of, you know, battle cry is that people deserve the information that exists. And I've curated it, you know, into, uh, you know, this book is 10 years of my research, basically. Um, I was joking that it's like $16.96 on Amazon. And I was like, apparently 10 years of my life is worth 16 bucks. But it's, um, you know, it's, it's my compilation of, of the information that I feel people deserve to know before they make a decision that could be potentially a lifelong and life altering decision. Yeah, absolutely. And so let me ask you this. Do you ever recommend prescription medications for psychiatry, like antidepressants or any, anything along those lines for depressions or other mood disorders? Yeah. Uh, so, you know, at this point, I haven't started a patient on medication of any kind, uh, with one exception, which I'll tell you in about three years. And I can't imagine ever going back. So my patients know when they come into my practice, that this is not consistent with my approach or philosophy any longer, that the research that I have examined has compelled me to believe that we have been essentially um, sold a story and a promise about these medications. You know, we really, I love the idea of a safe, effective cure. That sounds wonderful. And guess what? If that existed, then I wouldn't feel so strongly about the misinformation that's out there. Unfortunately, the truth is very, very far from that in terms of the the truth about the data that um, essentially explains how largely ineffective these medications are. And that makes sense, right? Because what are they even doing? We, we, we have little idea, really. You know, we want to think they're just acting on one chemical. But of course, any pharmaceutical product has up to 75 potential side effects unpredictable side effects because we don't really know. It's like I I use the the example of a spider web. Like in conventional medicine, we think we can just pull one thread and leave the whole web alone. But of course, that's not how it works, right? You pull one thread and the whole web moves. So, you know, in terms of the unpredictability of side effects, you know, there are, uh, there's a website called SSRI Stories that compiles all of the media making uh, violence, you know, homicide, suicide, infanticide, even mass murder, um, and really compelling, 
compellingly demonstrates that these people were all either recently started on psychiatric medication or recently taken off it. Now you could say, oh, well, they were mentally ill. So this is a, you know, it's just a coincidental factor, but it's actually very well documented in the literature that these medications have an unpredictable potential for violence. So that's quite a Russian roulette, you know, um, if, if you don't know, even after a first, second, or 10th dose, you might actually act impulsively in a way that is irreversible. You know, we need to take these more seriously than they're be, being taken. You know, they're sort of handed out like Skittles from primary care doctor's offices. You know, but they also don't fit um, sort of a model of health that I support, right? So if you believe that fundamentally the body is a minefield of dysfunction, right? Like if you believe fundamentally the body is broken and you could be born broken and destined to be broken forever and that you probably need chemicals to manage your experience so that you could keep functioning and get yourself to work every day, if that's your story, then medication is probably a good fit for you. You know, but if instead your story is different. And I think there are more and more people who are feeling into this version, which is that, you know, we've made a lot of mistakes, you know, in the history of medicine. And probably we haven't really even tapped the complexity of this organism. And it might, you know, make more sense for us to cooperate with it and to work with it and to acknowledge that we cannot win if we just seek to dominate it. Suppressing symptoms is only going to maybe if anything, by us time. And in my opinion, inevitably, inevitably going to complicate, you know, the, the potential for, for self-healing. So it's a different perspective and they really don't go together. So, you know, I know there are a lot of doctors out there who do both, you know, who do integrative medicine, some prescribing, some natural medicine. And to me, it's almost like, you know, being, being an atheist and a, and a Christian at the same time, you know, that their belief systems underpinning them are very different. So, I believe passionately that every single person has, you know, the the tools and the resources to get to the root of this problem, but you have to sort of want to, you know, so that's a critical piece. Yeah, absolutely. So let's, let's talk a little about SSRIs. Can you explain what they are, how they're really, I mean, I guess they're supposed to work, but what you perceive them doing instead. And then I'd love to talk about alternatives to that. Absolutely. Because this would be the most common um, yeah. psychiatric prescription. For sure, yeah. One in four women um, of reproductive age are taking uh, an antidepressant medication. 11% of Americans, it's quite quite a common uh, experience at this point. And understand, understandably so, right? Because we are struggling in very new and complicated ways right now that we haven't, you know, for the better part of even, you know, 200 years, we've been sick in ways that we never were sick in human history. So, you know, people are desperate, they're reaching for solutions. And we've been sold this idea largely by pharmaceutical companies that are allowed through direct to consumer advertising to speak to civilians about their health, even though their, you know, profits are driving their messaging. There are only two countries in the world that allow that here in New Zealand, interestingly. So, you know, we've been told this story that depression is probably genetic, and that it's an inherited problem that you're going to have for life and that you need to manage with a chemical prescription. And and what's interesting is that, you know, in 60 years of research, this theory called the monoamine theory or the or the chemical imbalance theory of depression has not a shred of scientific evidence to support it. There's been a lot of effort, you know, we've been cutting apart brains, testing blood, testing urine, doing, you know, volunteer samples using tryptophan. And there is no evidence that the serotonin theory of depression has any validity. So then what? So then what are these medications doing? Well, in fact, they're not working any better than any other medications that you give to somebody who struggles with depression, whether that medication acts on serotonin, dopamine, norepinephrine, whether it's a thyroid hormone, whether it's a beta blocker, they all work at around a 27 to 30% rate. Not so hot, right? But then if you dig deeper and there's someone named Irving Kirsch, who's a a placebo effect expert and a psychologist who has dug deeper. And he did two meta-analyses where he basically showed, you know what, when you take the unpublished literature, because psychiatry likes to keep its negative data in a locked file drawer, and it's actually allowed, you know, these industries allowed to do that 
you know, based on FDA standards. So when you take the unpublished data and you really analyze how much of what we are calling the effect is actually because of the medication versus placebo, it disappears. So this is a very controversial finding, which essentially suggested that the reason that people think these medications work is because of a placebo effect. Now, people think a placebo effect and they think, oh, I'm being duped, like there's no way. Every time I lecture, I have somebody stand up in the back and say, oh, I don't care what you say, Prozac has saved my life. And I believe that because I actually believe the placebo effect is a very powerful tool. You know, we've misunderstood it, but it's a very real physiochemical phenomenon. And... In psychiatry, it's never more important uh, because it really seems to drive most of what we are seeing. Now, there's another layer of effect that's also at play, though, because these medications, like any chemicals, um, have a broad spectrum of effects, right? So, um, you know, similar to, to, to alcohol, if you were a very anxious person and you had a shot of vodka before you went to a party, odds are you'd feel a bit less anxious, a bit more able to socialize. Your symptoms would be reduced, right? So you could see deciding to use that as a treatment, right? So to take a shot of vodka every single day, and you could see sort of continuing with that for a period of months or maybe years. And no one would ever assert that you have an alcohol deficiency and that's why it's working, right? It's just a chemical effect that you happen to like, but there's a cost. Everyone knows the cost, right? And of course, coming off of alcohol is never quite an easy thing if you've been doing it daily for a period of 10, 15 years, like so many of my patients you know, with their antidepressant prescriptions. So we really need to recenter the chemical effects as potentially something you like, but unfortunately, you know, there's no free lunch. And a lot of what you believe about these medications has been sort of programmed by our media. And it's a big, big part of what we're seeing. Uh, in terms of, you know, effects. But I wouldn't have, uh, you know, an over a year wait list in my practice if these medications worked. You know, there is such a demand for, um, you know, this kind of thinking about mental health and looking at it as more complex than just a, a simple, you know, brain chemical issue. Um, and it's because people are not actually feeling well, doing better, getting better on medication for the most part. So, you know, that sort of begs the question, well, what is it then? You know, what is depression? What are, what are we looking at? If it's not a serotonin imbalance, then what's the deal? And there's about, you know, 20 years of literature now, amazingly, this has been going on for 20 years, that um, have been talking about depression as being an inflammatory disorder, right? So it's not a disease. It's a syndrome or maybe even just a symptom, just the way a fever is a symptom. Doesn't tell you much about what's causing it. You still have to look and investigate, right? Uh, but, but maybe it's just an expression of imbalance. Um, and this theory has basically shown that depression and the symptoms of depression, right, uh, actually serve a purpose, like any symptom, right? Like we like, like to think of our bodies as like annoying us when we get symptoms, right? But the truth is the symptoms serve a purpose. They're there for a reason. You know, when you, uh, you know, are food poisoned, you need to have diarrhea for a reason. Taking Imodium is only going to make things worse for you, you know? So we have to sort of begin to think differently about how the body expresses its imbalances. But from this perspective, depression can be you know, driven by an autoimmune condition, such as, you know, the one I struggle with, um, Hashimoto's, it can be a single nutrient deficiency, like a B12 deficiency, it can be a food uh, reaction like wheat or dairy, it can be an expression of imbalance and mismatch with your stress relationship, you know, with with your lifestyle, with your psycho spiritual orientation towards your life, which, you know, causes a cascade of alarm, physiologically, so we have to sort of know what it is for you. But the beauty is that even without totally knowing the answer, you can still intervene with these like top down um, lifestyle interventions that move the needle so much more dramatically than, you know, uh, in my opinion, than a medication ever could. I mean, even if you see a conventional psychiatrist, they're going to tell you, oh, it takes six to eight weeks for medication to work, right? I mean, you know, my entire initiatory program is a 30 day program. I see patients one month after follow-up and I never, ever could have dreamt of the results that I get now that I've stopped prescribing. 
uh, when I was prescribing. I mean, it's just, there's no comparison, but I think it's because I don't prescribe that I hold this expectation and it's quite a serious thing. You know, my patients don't get a second appointment if they haven't done the homework, you know? And so that relationship of empowering them, I believe that they can do it and they experience a degree of hope that maybe they wouldn't have otherwise. There's, you know, energetically something that happens that allows this month, you know, experiment to be extremely effective. Yeah, absolutely. So inflammation is a big part of this. You think this is a big underlying factor. Oh, it's interesting. I, I talk a lot about skin and we talk about, I talk about skin inflammation because I feel like so much of, of the, our skin issues have to do with internal inflammation and mm-hmm. that's what triggers us to have skin problems. So you're also talking about with the brain, a lot of, probably a lot of the same things that are causing people to have skin problems are also causing them to have imbalances with their neurochemistry, or maybe it's not even neurochemistry, it's just the brain that is impacted. Exactly. And and so this is the beauty of where medicine is going. You know, the, the research substantiates what you're saying. That's already in the scientific research that everything is systemically connected, right? It's not like skin and then brain and then gut. And then, you know, you have the heart over here and the lungs. That's That's old medicine. And what we are learning is that there is a symphonic, you know, sort of um, expression at all times of all of our systems. They're all communicating and they're all trying to adapt to this unfortunately quite toxic world we're living in and a lifestyle that is so divorced from what two and a half million years of evolution have prepared us for, you know, what's happened in the past 100 years to our products, to our food supply, to our environmental exposures is, you know, mind boggling to expect that the fact that we're even alive and walking around sometimes amazes me, you know, considering what a demand it is on our physiology to exist in this world. So I certainly don't think that inflammation is the the one size fits all explanation for everything, obviously. Um, But I do think that it's the most common driver of much of chronic disease. And again, it's just really the body's way of communicating that it is reacting and responding to what it perceives to be uh, instability and threat. Yeah. I think a lot of people think of inflammation as something you can see, but you can't always see inflammation like with what you're talking about. That's right. And, and, you know, there are, there are some important papers that look at um, gluten exposure and associated inflammation, for example, as being even over 80% of the time, a neurologic manifestation without even any uh, gastrointestinal complaints. So it's like totally silent where you think you would, you know, have complaints. And then it's manifesting far away from the gut, you know, in, in behavior, cognition and mood. So we have to sort of, you know, embrace this level of flexibility. You're not going to get to the root of it. Yeah. Okay. So now you talked about how one in four women are on an antidepressant, correct? Is that, that was the statistic that you said? Right. Okay, so we've got people listening, watching that are on antidepressants right now. Yeah. There's a really good chance of that, right? So yeah. I, I don't want people to panic and think, oh, I need to stop this right away. So let's talk about that. What yeah. should they? What should people do if they're on an antidepressant already? Yes. So essentially, you know, what I do in my practice and what I outline, you know, in a mind of your own is is really the same intervention and not that there's such a thing as a one size fits all, but it's, it's a very, um, templated intervention for every category of person, right? So for somebody who knows in their heart that they have no interest in ever taking a medication for someone who is taking a medication and has no intention of discontinuing it, but just has some residual symptoms and would like to feel a bit better. And for someone who has intentions of coming off psychiatric medication, I do the same thing for all those categories of people. And I start with, you know, fortifying resiliency physiologically, because I learned the hard way that when you don't start with these things and you try to take somebody off a medication, it is disastrous. I mean, it's totally disastrous. And, and I was actually taught in my training when people develop symptoms, when they come off medication to say, Oh, well, you see, you should have never come off. This is evidence that you're still sick and you need to take it forever. We are taught to say that, but now of course, the literature has caught up with the millions of people online who are trying to help each other around antidepress- antidepressant withdrawal. And the literature has caught up to suggest that, you know, this is a real phenomenon, this withdrawal phenomenon. So 
I believe in starting with about like a one to two month adherence. I, I'm not like a half, you know, half ass kind of girl. Like I really believe in, in a dedicated uh, effort. And it may not be tomorrow that, you know, you may, you may be ready in a year, but when you're ready, do it, you know, commit fully because you want change, you want results. And this is the way to achieve it. You know, don't cheat yourself. I, I feel pretty strongly about that. Um, that not everyone is ready, but when you're ready, you'll know. So my recommendation is first to start with dietary change. So that's the part that I'm most strict about. It's really not that difficult. You know, I'm not asking you to go on a 30 day juice cleanse. I'm, you know, essentially asking for the elimination of processed food. And for the vast majority of, of, of women, if you don't have an ethical, um, you know, sort of conflict around it, this is a red meat inclusive diet that is very focused on sourcing. So it's all pastured animal products um, and as much organic produce as you possibly can, you know, prioritize for this, you know, window. So essentially it's meat, fish, eggs, you know, vegetables, particularly cruciferous vegetables, you know, like broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cauliflower, that sort of thing. Um, Starchy vegetables are included like sweet potato uh, and then nuts and seeds. But of course the excluded categories are, you know, more strict in the first month than they are ongoing, but it does include all grains, does include legumes like beans, peanuts, and soy, um, and does include dairy, which I know is the really hard one. That was very hard for me, um, having been addicted to it my entire life. Uh, so that is the, is the number one focus. And it's often, it often means that there's not a lot of eating out for that month. It often means that you have to restock your pantry it often means that the people in your house have to do this with you, um, which I personally think is a great thing, you know? So that priority is, is, is then sort of, um, coupled with some other interventions like, um, three minutes a day of a specific kind of meditation called, um, Kundalini yoga, which is really simple, but I find to be the most effective form of stress response, you know, management, um, Exercise, if you're not already doing it and otherwise are able to, just 20 minutes a week of a burst exercise model, which is high intensity, low volume exercise one time a week. Uh, and then begins the process that you know you educate people about, which is sort of detoxifying your environment and your products and, you know, sort of the outer, you know, experience. Um, I, you know, I use a lot of other detox um, tools, including coffee enemas in my practice practice and skin brushing, um, to facilitate coming off of medication. But most importantly is that coming off of medication is something that needs to be done very strategically and very, in my experience, very slowly. Um, you know, so I have patients depending on how long you've been on a medication who come off it, you know, I have one patient I take off of Lexapro at a thousandth of a milligram a month. It's extremely small amount. So this is, um, this is necessary to keep, you know, a level of stability, uh, during the process for some people, but not all. So it's definitely not the, you know, you never, ever want to just stop in, uh, psychiatric medication yeah. under any circumstances. Absolutely. Yeah, I completely agree with that. And I think it's, it's really important to find a functional medicine doctor or a naturopathic physician to work with. Um, right. When you agree, I mean, you, this is, you can't do this alone. And, and most psychiatrists are not going to be able to help you with this. That's a great point. I'm glad you brought that up because I get asked all the time and I have obviously limited availability. Um, you know, what other psychiatrists are doing this? And it doesn't need to be a psychiatrist. That's the whole point is that actually, you know, tapering these medications is not rocket science. Um, I've, you know, written about it. Other folks have written about it. Um, it doesn't need to be a psychiatrist because once we sort of get out of this idea that it needs to be a specialist in the brain or, you know, in the mind, whatever a psychiatrist actually is, then we're into the idea that it's all connected. And so anyone who has training like, you know, chiropractors, naturopaths, even some acupuncturists and, um, and, you know, anyone with functional medicine training, they know how to do this. You know, it's all basically just being applied to the psychiatric model, but it's the same set of interventions that we're all sort of emphasizing. 
Yeah. Um, and there's not, you know, there's not any special supplements for this, you know, for this type of protocol necessarily. It's, it's a focus on healing the gut primarily, which is what we all realize is critical, right? We all realize we're not going to get very far in reversing um, illness without focusing on, on the gut. Yeah. And then what, how do you feel about supplements like GABA, 5-HTP, some of, uh, some of those um, St. John's wort? How do you feel about those? So, um, I sort of, you know, am like a bit of a pain in the ass for some of my, um, holistic colleagues, because I argue that, you know, if we, if we're looking for the natural Prozac, then we're, then we seem to be buying into the fact that Prozac is something we want to emulate. And I've just told you, forget about it. You know, I just told you, actually, the data suggests that it's more problem than, than it is benefit. Um, so I'm not looking for a natural Prozac. So I don't use 5-HTP and tryptophan in my practice unless I am taking someone off medication. And then sometimes it can be helpful, but never as like a natural antidepressant. It makes no sense to me. In fact, high serotonin levels are correlated with many, many problematic states, including autism, schizophrenia, serotonin syndrome. Like these are not desirous, um, desirable states. So I don't use those up front. I do use other amino acids, but um, like including GABA and something called PharmaGABA, which is a you know another version of it. Um, but for the most part, I actually use um, a lot of glandulars and in my practice. So you know whether it's thyroid, adrenal, even brain glandulars like hypothalamus, um, liver, and I use focus on basic minerals. But I don't um, and vitamins, but I don't really work with any supplements in the first month because my interest is in seeing what do you look like? Like, would you still come back to my office after a month with complaints if we just focus on, you know, the diet, meditation and movement piece? Um, Maybe your symptoms be totally gone. I've had this happen countless times. So we don't want to like pile on a bunch of supplements and then not have any good sense of what was responsible for moving the needle because my passion is really to show people how simple it can be. Um, and I'd rather not overcomplicate it with, you know, tens of thousands of dollars of testing and, you know, even more of supplements up front. And obviously some cases are more complex and require that level of intervention for, for sure. Um, but I, I don't, it's not a huge focus up front. Absolutely. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about your book that just came out because tell, 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 share with us what your experience has been with that so far. I, I love what you've been sharing. I think it's so valuable. I think it's important for people to hear this. I think it's, we get so stuck in the way that we're doing things and it just becomes the normal. And I don't think it's normal for one in four women to be on antidepressants. So thank you so much for the work you're doing, but tell us about what's going on with your book. Yeah. So, so it's absolutely true what you're saying. It's, it's, you know, it's called sometimes consensus medicine or eminence-based medicine as opposed to evidence-based, which is, it's just sort of like what people are doing out there and everyone else is doing it. So we're all going to just do it and ignore, you know, the conflict with the available literature. And this happens across specialties. And so, you know, I take on in the book, a number of different pharmaceutical products. um, Because once I started digging I didn't stop with Prozac and Paxil. You know, I I was interested. I took birth control for 12 years. What about that? You know, I had patients, women who came into me on cholesterol medicines, acid blocking medicines, women who were taking, you know, Tylenol every day. Um, And, you know, I had patients who um, were getting vaccines during their pregnancy. And I wanted to know, you know, what does the literature actually show? So, you know, I I take a, a tour of, you know, over-the-counter medicines and some of these more commonly prescribed medicines to let you know, again, in the interest of a fuller informed consent, what some of the maybe less popular literature is saying about the the risks and sort of the, I don't know, the, the less exciting outcomes that you could expect than what you're told, you know, when you're first offered one of these uh, medications. So maybe because of that, um, it, you know, <laughs> my publishing uh, company, HarperCollins, was very surprised uh, when a month before the book launch on Mar- March 15th, I hadn't booked a single moment of mainstream exposure, you know, not Dr. Oz, not Today Show, not doctors, not nothing. And they were starting to get no's back. And in fact, one network um, 
came back and said, you know, we're going to do you the favor of telling you that if we were to cover this book, it would be negative press for you. So I knew that this was going to happen. You know, I'm familiar with sort of the ins and outs of the enmeshment between media and industry. Um, and they were really surprised because I don't think they've had much experience with somebody speaking out against some of these medication related issues. But the book is really not, um, it's not an anti-pharma book. It's, it's not an anti-psychiatry book. It's really meant to be exciting and empowering. And it's meant to actually be like, a pro natural healing, pro informed choice, um, you know, sort of manifesto. So I really, you know, tapped this community of, of folks like yourself who share these beliefs because this to me represents an opportunity for us to sort of make a statement about what we feel actually deserves media coverage and, and, you know, what we, and supporting a mainstream publisher for actually taking a risk with somebody like me. Um, and I, and it's, it's so thrilling because I feel this energy all around me, you know, building that people are ready and they sort of sense the bankruptcy of the current model. You know, they sense that it's not working to have six different doctors you have to run off to all different specialists who are piling meds on you. And then, you know, you need meds for the side effects of the meds that were supposed to help the side effects. And it just becomes a hamster wheel and no one is actually feeling well. I mean, it's, it's like there's an epidemic of suffering despite the fact that we're all pretty well treated with our medications. Right. So I find it really exciting. I, I hope to, um, you know, awaken a little, that little voice, you know, in, in, in whomever is, is sort of ready to, to give it a, a microphone um, and to pre present it like a menu for transformation, because it's really much more my goal than, than alleviating symptoms naturally. Much more my goal is to help women specifically, but you know, men are getting very upset that I've, I've targeted women only in this book, because it really isn't gender specific. But nonetheless, I really want it to be an opportunity for women to sort of be like, ah. Oh, that makes so much sense. Like in some part of me, I knew that was true, you know, and, and to give, um, you know, a degree of agency back to, to them in their experience and to demand something more than just suppressing symptoms and getting back to work, you know, and, and functioning to sort of like shed a layer of fear that we've been, you know, really acculturated to that. I, I think it's sort of not serving us. Um, so that's sort of my, you know, sort of soared aloft, but I, we'll see. Yeah, we'll see. It's, it's been a fun ride so far. Yeah. Yeah. You're definitely a woman on a mission. I can tell. Um, and I love it. I absolutely love it. That's why when I was hearing about what you were doing with your book and everything, I wanted to have you on right away. So I, I applaud you for everything you're doing. And I know that naturopathic doctors have been struggling for years to get out the message about what you're talking about. And sometimes it's even harder for a medical doctor like yourself to come out and say these things because you get even the pushback from your colleagues. So yes, it's at once harder and also potentially ridiculously more impactful because much of what I'm saying, you know, Ayurveda, Chinese medicine, naturopathic medicine has been saying for hundred, you know, to thousands of years, you know, the, the same messaging, but because it's coming from someone who has conventional training, it seems to have a bit of a different impact. So I guess I'm in a position to, to be a bridge, you know, to this very ancient, uh, wisdom that is already, you know, under our noses, but it's just a matter of sort of like, you know, waking people up to, to the fact that it's there, that it's safe and that it works. Yeah, absolutely. And I love that you talk about, it's like getting back in touch with our intuition too. We get separated yeah. from ourselves when we, and when we take these medications, it separates ourselves even more. So getting back to trusting nature, trusting our body and, um, and getting, getting back in tune with that. Cause that's where we get so much information. And sometimes it's a process to get back in alignment. Oh, no question. I mean, I, I didn't even know what intuition meant a couple of years ago. Everything was supposed to be solved and fixed from my brain. Right. And it, you know, I lived in this very masculine energy. Um, but, and it takes a lot of time. I mean, I'm now, you know, seven years into my own health journey and I am just now beginning to really understand what it means to trust a process. What it means to trust a process is to tell yourself every time you experience adversity, that it's including symptoms, including tragedies, that it's going to be okay. 
you know, it's going to be okay. And in the end, there's something in here that I need. It's a weird concept, but it, it extends to how, you know, again, naturopathic doctors and, and traditional healers think about symptoms. There's some message in there that I need. So I want to listen to it, you know, rather than just ignore it and, and suppress it. It's a different psychology. But once you get there, life is not like a, a stressful minefield you just have to get through. It becomes this sort of like super interesting ride, you know, that you're just enjoying it truly. So, you know, take it from someone who was on the other side, you know, that, that it's absolutely possible to, to totally reconfigure your experience of, of stress, uh, around, around sort of the day-to-day experience. Excellent. All right. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Brogan. I really appreciate the interview today and your information, your inspiration. Thank you so much. I appreciate it too, Trevor. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed this interview today with Dr. Kelly Brogan. To learn more about Dr. Brogan, you can go to my website, thespadoctor.com, go to the podcast page with her interview, and you'll find all the information and links about her book there. And while you're there, I invite you to join the Spa Doctor community on my website or subscribe to the podcast on iTunes so you don't miss any of our upcoming shows. And if you haven't done so already, I highly recommend that you get your customized skin profile at theskinquiz.com. It's free and based upon answers to just a few questions, you'll get your own customized skin profile. And don't miss out on the latest tips on glowing skin and vibrant health. Join me on Facebook, Pinterest, Twitter, and Instagram. Enjoy the conversation. Thank you, and I'll see you next time.